morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mart Hulikens. I'm from Belgium. Uh, I work at Ghent University at the Cultural Policy Center. So my main research topic is actually cultural participation. Uh, and I also study digitalization in the cultural sector. This is actually a very interesting area of study because cultural participation tends to be very exclusive. Um, you need certain cultural skills, a certain education level to participate in culture. And digitalization is often seen as uh, a way of making culture more inclusive. I will be focusing mostly on the visual arts because digitalization has been um, furthest developed in that area, of, uh, in that cultural field. Okay, so digitalization has been a buzzword in visual arts for quite a while now. Um, and when museums talk about digitalization, it often entails um, digitalizing their collection or um, yeah, just all the cultural products that they have. Uh, the Tate Modern was like a very important museum for this, but also in Belgium we have the Expertise Center for Di Digital Heritage uh, that helps heritage initiatives to archive um, their collections. And the idea is always by making these things available, culture will become accessible and more inclusive. Uh, and this is also something that is very much um, promoted by the Flemish government. Our former Minister of Culture, Sven Gatz, wrote a vision report on um, cultural policy in the digital era. And the first paragraph actually states, in principle, digital culture content needs to be open. Providing open access to digital cultural content realizes the broadest possible diffusion of culture for local and international communities. So again, this idea, by making culture available online, it will lead to um, democratization. Of course, I am a sociologist, and I think most people here uh, will put a question mark behind that. Uh, we know about the digital divide. Um, there's unequal access uh, to ICT sources, but also um, unequal outcomes when ICT is used. And actually, a paper that I use a lot is uh, a paper on digital social inequalities by Halford and Savage, uh, where they try to link literature on um, social exclusion or inclusion with um, the digital divide. So they actually apply theories uh, on sociological theories on social exclusion uh, on the digital divide. And the idea that they put forward is that digitalization can actually lead to more social exclusion. Um, and they do that by focusing on a Bourdieuian perspective, which Pierre Bourdieu is a very famous uh, sociologist who, who wrote about social uh, exclusion. Uh, and they put forward that when uh, digitalization is used uh, mostly by groups that already are privileged, they will be able to accumulate different types of capital, and they will be able to convert those capitals um, into different types of capital. So for example, if you have digital skills, um, you will be able to build a larger social network, so building your social capital, and that could lead to um, enhancing your economic capital as well. So like I said, it is a Bourdieuian perspective. Maybe some of the people with a more academic background know uh, Bourdieu. Um, his theory states that uh, people have cultural capital, and cultural capital you get from the family of origin, the family that you were born in. Uh, if you are born in a family where, where your parents are interested in culture, you develop an interest in culture yourself, dispositions uh, to like culture, and those dispositions will help you in later life to get an education uh, and to, build, uh, to get access to um, important social networks. And that, in turn, can lead to um, enhancing your economic capital or your class position. Uh, and the idea is, well, if you uh, use online cultural capital, but it's just, it, it might become part of that chain of cultural capital. So people who already have cultural capital benefit most and are able to transpose um, those skills into other types of capitals. So that is basically the uh, theoretical framework that I use for my research. Um, and this theory has already been applied to heritage studies. In a paper of Taylor and Gibson from 2017 about heritage activities, 
um, they apply Bourdieu to a very basic scheme of communication that says, well, you have creators that uh, determine what heritage or culture is, or gatekeepers, people who are working in a museum, um, and they can use the internet or use, use digital resources um, to ascribe meaning to those cultural objects. So that would be an encoding process, where people are encoding meaning onto certain cultural objects. Um, and then the public needs to, be, uh, needs to do decoding, so they, they need to decode the um, message that was put on there by the creators. But one of the cruxes for, uh, for, for cultural policy is that this decoding process requires educational skills and uh, cultural capital. So museums focusing too much on the decoding process, so just making things available and trying to let people um, figure out what the meaning is by themselves, actually might lead to more cu cultural and social exclusion. And this especially happens when museums use a top-down approach, where they ascribe the meaning, where they provide the content, um, and, and then just hope that people will, um, will consume it by themselves. Does that mean that the internet has, or, or digital resources have no democratic potential? Of course it does. Uh, for example, the web 2.0, there's literature on network citizen users on social media and convergence culture where people are actually creating content themselves or, or sharing messages on social media themselves. And this creates an open environment which might be more democratic than just looking up information. When we apply this to uh, our scheme, it might be the case that the museums have been focusing on the wrong part of this model. It's not only about providing information that can be decoded, but you actually have to um, help people to create content themselves, so focusing on the encoding part. So based on this literature, I had a few hypotheses about digital cultural participation. The first one is online participation with visual arts is structured by cultural, economic, and social cap capital. So exactly the same variables that are important to understand cultural participation. So the people who already participate in culture will also engage with the online content, so not leading to um, more inclusivity. This will be especially the case for receptive online participation, and receptive online participation is um, looking at uh, collections online, looking at information that was provided by museums or heritage initi initiatives. And my last hypothesis was active online participation will not be structured by cultural, economic, and social capital. So actually sharing things online or uh, creating your own content might not be structured by those uh, variables that we use to um, analyze social uh, inequalities. We tested this with a number of data sets. I'm not going to go into details uh, about the technicalities. But we find that receptive cultural participation, so visiting museums, is very much structured by uh, cultural, economic, and uh, social capital. Um, and active cultural participation, so actually engaging in visual arts yourself, um, painting, drawing, things like that, is not structured by these variables, or only very little, a very small educational effect. Online cultural participation, so um, engaging with culture online, we do find uh, a strong effect of cultural capital, but the problem here is that we don't really know whether this relates to receptive or active cultural participation. Uh, therefore, we also looked at different data sets. Uh, the first one is Kunstwerk Survey 2018, which is a big organization uh, for people who are actively engaged in visual arts, but on an amateur level, so not professional uh, artists. And we looked at internal and external use for active participation. So do they use the internet uh, for their hobby, and is there some social structuration there? And here we find no effects of social, economic, and cultural capital. So people who are involved in visual arts, um, both when they have lower education levels, higher education levels, a, a big social network or a smaller social, social network, they all use the internet both for internal and external use. Internal use means that you um, use the internet to 
do your hobby, for example, look at uh, instruction movies online. Uh, an external use is that you share what you have made online, so sharing your um, products online. Then we also looked at the audience survey for urban art museums, so people who are visiting museums, and we looked at the use of online resources prior and during the museum visit. So people who are visiting the museums, who uses online resources prior to the museum? And then we see it's the frequent visitors with cultural and economic capital. So these are the people who are looking up information online, looking at collections that have been digitalized. And that is very much structured by the same variables as cultural participation itself. For, um, for online engagement during the museum, we find uh, smaller effects. Uh, no effect of cultural and economic capital, but here we have to be careful because not a lot of people are actually looking up information during uh, their visit. And then an interesting finding was that taking selfies at museums is actually not structured by variables. So both very frequent um, visitors with highly endowed with a lot of cultural capital take selfies, but also the visitors who only visit one time and uh, might have a lower education, higher age, um, also take selfies. So there, there's not really any structuring there. Of course, it's a question whether we want that in museums, but it does show that um, those types of involvement are more democratic, more inclusive. So this is, as a conclusion, my hypotheses were correct. I'm not going to uh, repeat them again. Uh, and what does that mean? When I, well, when I talk to museums of people in cultural policy, I try to explain that they shouldn't be focusing too much on that decoding process if their goal is to be more inclusive. If they want to be more inclusive or uh, be more democratic, they need to focus on this part, the encoding part, where people can actually um, create content themselves um, and, are, and use those digital resources uh, closer to their own life world, to the interests that they have, to the um, engagement that they already have with visual arts. That's a very difficult task, but there are uh, some museums who already have tried to do this with particip uh, uh, participatory uh, projects with communities around the museums, and the results have been positive so far. So um, using digital resources um, only helps when people who are not really interested in culture are able to use them for things that they are interested in themselves and when they are able to create content themselves, so change um, the, 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 the content of what the museum is offering. When it's just um, looking at information or reading information, so educational purposes, those things are far less effective. So that's my um, general take that I give to, to museums, but I hope that this presentation can also be helpful uh, for general discussion on digital inclusion. Thank you.